Hello, I'm Gail Johnson. Hello, uh, I am Dr. Antonio Vito. Hi, my name is Suta Bolra. Hello, I'm Irene Rathbon. Hello, my name is Meli Narvaez. Hello, dear friend, this is Leila Mosso. I look so forward to talking and sharing and discussing ideas on birth with you in optimal birth. I look forward to seeing you all in our meeting in Optimal Birth. I can't wait to meet you on Optimal Birth, the panel discussion. I'm enjoying this. And I am so honored to be part of Optimal Birth. A fantastic upcoming event with our multidisciplinary team about Optimal Birth panel discussion. It's happening in 28 February, 5 p.m. IST. Hope to see you. One, Namaskar to my Indian Dostan. Good evening, all our friends who are meeting us here today with this uh, panel discussion about optimal birth. My name is Irene Garzón. I'm from Spain. I'm a midwife, a midwifery educator and a writer. At present, I live in the UK and very soon, hopefully, somewhere else. I've got with me a very interesting uh, experts panel that I'm going to uh, introduce to you uh, in a moment. I just wanted to welcome you that we are really happy that you've joined us. I can see all of you waving. Thank you very much for being here. And now I'm going to uh, let uh, Leila. Uh, introduce herself. Am I audible now? Am I audible now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Hello, salam alaikum, uh, hola, and namaste, namaskar to everybody. I am Leila Mustafi. I'm thankful to all of you for joining us today for this amazing event of Optimal Birth Panel Discussion. This has been an honor to be joined by my colleagues, Irene, Dr. Antonio, Juta, Gail, Meli, and Krishinda. Our UK concern, Samco Company, is into healthcare and industry for the last 20 years. And Lily Excellence Center is affiliated to Samco and has been active in Middle East, Europe, UAE, and Iran. I am senior consultant midwife, founder and owner of Lily Excellence Center, affiliated to Samco UK. All of us have come together to join hands to make this project a reality. We are into training midwives, gynecologists, all trainers, doctors, healthcare professionals, technicians, nurses, and not forgetting mothers. We specialize uh, in end-to-end -end training solution in easy free, antenatal, postnatal, prenatal, postpartum, family health, pre and postnatal um, conception and postconception. We are we as a group has an overall experience of 180 years, and that is an ocean of experience. I have learned from my vast experience that there has to be a robust structured project to be rolled out for the betterment of the society and especially for women all of the ages. Today I'm joined with the World Class Lily Excellence Center team from seven different countries with diverse cultures. We are training on different platforms like online, face-to-face, -face, right. and client sites like large healthcare centers, okay. and universities, and All of us have been thinking so, so this this for market. over a year now as to have to take it for what. Finally, we have decided to give life to give the world best of the knowledge in midwifery and gynecology. Both are now teamed up together, bring to the world that these two go hand in hand and are incomplete without one another. We have been working along with healthcare centers and specialists, including gynecologists, physiotherapists, and media houses. This has been a long journey and I would love our initiative, and some are still work in progress. We are planning to have this session. 
and every month so that we reach out to more and more midwives and aspirants who are in search of knowledge. Thank you so much for all of you. I will keep trying and working towards the great mission about bringing awareness to every nook and corner. Love you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leila. Uh, Gail, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, um, I'm Gail Johnson. Um, I'm a midwife for about 40 years, but I've been involved in the birth movement as a childbirth teacher, as a hypnotherapist and all that for about 50 to 60 years. So I think I'm the oldest of all you guys. And I'm so proud of you all because you got your young energy and you're, you're exciting and you're going to make changes that women have wanted you to fight for them for years and years and years. And now because of the internet and because of the COVID, we're actually getting to meet people from all over the world that we wouldn't have done. So in a way, the bad has become the good. So I'm happy to see you all. My passion uh, for birth involves empowering women. I've been a woman's advocate for years. And um, I was way back when we were just fighting to be allowed to breastfeed. I mean, I mean, way back. So that, and I had children when I was very young. So I have been involved on some level with babies and moms and births for a long time. My passion is the pelvis because, and the positions for birth, because that is where I see we hinder a lot. We all know we have the four Ps, right? We have the power of the contractions. We have the passenger, which involves the position of the baby. We have the passage, which is the pelvis, which we find in hospitals is okay. very restrictive. Okay. You, you're just going, you're just so passionate. You're just going so I a know. little bit ahead. Let's, let we, shh, let's wait to talk about that in a moment. Let's introduce okay. the rest of the, of the team members. And then you can tell us everything about the pelvis. We're all looking forward to hearing your expertise you. in that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, that was Gail, she's in Belize at the moment, and now uh, Jutta, she's uh, one of our experts from Germany. So, hello everybody, namaste, and welcome to our panel. So, hi, my name is Jutta Wohlrab, and a long time ago I said once, good news, bad news, pizza and parcels should be delivered, but babies should be born. So, in the past 38 years, I've been a professional international midwife, I'm a coach, trainer, speaker, author, and I have uh, a midwifery practice here in Berlin, in Germany, and have worked all over the world. And I'm all excited to meet you because there is so many different expertises that are important when we think about the beginning of life, the start of family, giving birth, and we know birth is a global matter, and it's going to be great to connect and bring it up on the next level, as it should be. So this is me from Germany, and I'm excited to meet all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jutta. Now, Tony is, uh, Dr. Antonio Brito is uh, joining us from Spain. Hello to everyone. Good morning, good evening, whatever you are. Uh, yes. Namaste. Uh, I am uh, Antonio Brito, Tony, Tony Brito. I am uh, from, from the Canary Island in Spain. I trained uh, myself in the uh, United Kingdom as a gynecologist, obstetrician, and I have been uh, uh, for more than 30 years uh, uh, working in, uh, in, the, in the in home confinement and in the, in the hospitals. And I, I am right now working in the uh, National Health System in, in Spain as a gynecologist, and I'm excited to 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 meet all all all, all of you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Melly is quite uh, close to you, uh, at least geographically. Yeah. So let's introduce uh, Melly from the Canary Islands. I'm personal. Yes, person. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> yes, that's true. Hi, everyone. My name is Melly Narvai. I come from Andalusia, but I live in Canary Islands, which are, I'm talking about regions of Spain. <laughs> I just give it to granted that uh, everybody knows it, but sorry for that. And my biggest title is to be a mother. I always talk about this uh, because this is what brought me here. 
uh, I am midwife nearly as an accident. I mean, because I am a mother, I became midwife. I wasn't even a nurse. I wasn't given a health care. And my, my daughters are my biggest masters. And of course, all women, they are my biggest master. And um, I am going to talk uh, in this uh, meeting. Thank you so much to Lily Excellence Center, to Irene, to everybody to invite me. I feel really, really honored to be here. I am talking about uh, where is uh, the power and where is the authority of giving birth where is the authority or who has the authority for birth, uh, pregnancy? And of course, you're going to know the answer. Maybe you already have it. So thank you very much. And uh, hello to everyone from the different countries, from uh, United Kingdom, uh, Germany, uh, North America, India. Of course, thank you so much. And um, so I think we're going to have a really interesting talk here. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Melly. I like what you've done with your hair today. It looks really, really nice. And, <laughs> <laughs> and now, Krishinda, who is joining us from the UK. Hello. Hi, everybody. My name is Krishinda Powers Duff, and I'm a midwife for over 12 years. I'm also a mother, and I actually was a doula and then became a midwife because I felt that I needed to have more power to be able to support women uh, in their birthing role. Um, it's my great, great pleasure to be here and to be working with Lily Excellence Centre. And today I will be talking about uh, the hormones. I have a great, great passion for birth education, particularly for parents. And I have a fantastic passion for educating partners so that they feel empowered to be able to support uh, the women who are birthing and the birthing people uh, that they're supporting. So thank you so much for having me. Hello to everybody all over the world. How fantastic. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Krishinda. And Diane, I think you are there. Diane, Diane is an Irish midwife who is also part of uh, Lily Excellence uh, Centre. Can you hear us? Your, your mic, your mic is is is, is closed. Diane, you, sorry, I'm yeah. here now. I'm here now. It was telling me that as a participant, I wasn't allowed to unmute myself. <laughs> uh, my name is is Diane Lockhart. I'm a midwife trained in Ireland in the north, so officially Great Britain, but I identify as Irish. Um, I'm currently working in Uganda where I have a small birth center in one of the slum populations uh, in Uganda. Uh, we have one of the highest maternal and uh, neonatal death rates in, in the world. And um, it's, a, it's a huge tackle. I do have a small private business where I'm trying to encourage mothers to birth at home. Um, those mothers who would normally have gone home for their countries to, to give birth, I'm trying to encourage them to stay in the system here, uh, to enjoy having some home births. We've had water births, which is the first in the country, um, but I'm also trying to build those relationships with the, the local hospitals in terms of how their standards are so that women, women don't have a fear of giving birth here. Uh, I feel really humbled to be part of the group. I'm surrounded by so much experience and, and years. Um, I trained in 1989 and I worked as a sick children's and pediatric nurse for 10 years before I then uh, did my, my midwifery. So here I am and it's, it's a real pleasure to be with you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diane. So this is part of the uh, experts that we are going to uh, talk to you uh, today and we've decided to name this talk optimal birth because as we know optimal means what's best what's most favorable and well I don't understand I don't need to <laughs> explain to you what birth means because you wouldn't be here if you didn't know what it was so this is what we are going to try we've um, developed uh, this uh, 
point this uh, title because obviously optimal birth it's about physiology it's about the power of nature it's about letting uh, the body uh, guide us it's about the hormones it's about that connection between the mother and the baby and it's about that new father it's about support from professionals support from us to provide them with the environment and the tools they need to um, reach optimal birth or to get what they want but it's also about the knowledge it's uh, we know most births go well if we provide them with the right atmosphere and we provide uh, the we put the woman in the center of uh, what is happening but we also know that it's important to have the critical knowledge in case something deviates from that normality to be able to to uh, to address it so it's about respecting physiology and it's about being uh, knowledgeable and aware on when things uh, deviate a little bit from uh, physiology. Uh, so now I'm going to go back to dear Gail that wanted to talk to us about the pelvis and the four Ps. So the mic is yours, Gail. I'm sorry, I just get so carried away because it's just so exciting <laughs> to I'm, I'm all alone here in Belize with uh, out of hospital births because there's a lot of midwives in Belize, uh, like in the UK, they work in the hospitals, but I'm the only crazy person running around Belize doing babies at home. And so I don't have much comradeship to talk <laughs> to people that have a heart like I do. And so that's why I'm always so excited to meet you guys. Um, yeah, the reason I'm, uh, I'm specialized kind of in my thinking in the pelvis is because the positions for birth that we use in a hospital environment are based on evidence-based care. And we don't find hospitals very little are they practicing evidence-based care even with their own research. So I find that kind of hard to understand. But with the pelvis, I mean, I, this is my favorite little thing. And people don't know that the pelvis moves things get out of way for the baby, that we can use our pelvis to help the baby come out. But we very little ways to use the pelvis and to help the baby and to facilitate an easy gentle birth with an epidural and lying on your back. Now, I don't think any of you know anybody that has a, a birth on their back. No dog, no horse, no cow, no pig is going to lie on their back and stick their legs in the air. Uh, they're just not going to do it. And if you tried to make them do it, labor would stop. You disrupt an animal in birth with stress, with the way the procedures and protocols have been practiced, um, you are going to hinder the birth. I mean, if the pelvis can be limited by 30%. You know how much that is? Limiting a pelvis by 30% when putting a woman on her back to birth, you get more shoulder dystocia, you get more posterior babies. We are hindering birth. And so, and it's such a simple thing to fix. It's a simple thing. Let her get up, let her walk, let her squat, let her be on her hands and knees, let her lie on her side. I'm not asking for something horribly radical. I'm just saying, let her move. Let yes, her body Gail. look like an animal is to move. So, what do you I want me to shut up I was just wanted to already? say that what you said about animals and not being in their back, the only position worse than being on your back for me would be doing a handstand for a woman in labor. <laughs> I mean, that, that would be like, the, that's yeah, we being on the back is the gravity, second worst. Yeah. <laughs> we even take away gravity. But, you know, when, when I try to teach, I try to teach about the pelvis and, and make it fun. But the four Ps, I'll just, I won't explain them, but power, the passenger is the baby, the passage is the pelvis, and then we get into the psyche. And you guys are all teaching on aspects of these things. 
We know about trauma in birth. Women are traumatized for life. That's where the psyche and the emotional care comes in from their husbands, empowering the men I heard you talk about. Yes, men just stand there with their mouth hanging open and think, well, the doctor has to know. Um, so, no, he doesn't. And so I guess I'd better be quiet. I don't want to okay. take all your time. No, no, <laughs> you don't have to be quiet. I would like to say okay. something because I totally agree with you, Gail. And I teach a lot of classes myself and the pelvis is important because to me, there is three different aspects because I think we're just going to run it like this now. One is, um, you know, like for me, there's three reasons why birth can become complicated. One is there's a medical problem. And of course, a high blood pressure or something like this needs instant help. We know that. Yeah. That's why right. you have a midwife at your birth. The second right. thing is something in the mind, which we'll hear about a little later. We know fear is not a really good advisor. And the third thing is, of course, <laughs> always the pelvis. Because for me, the principle that you describe is the principle of lock and key. So the baby is the key and it's the lock. And I know all of you know that for sure you were standing at the door, putting the key in and you thought, far out, can't open the door. Somehow it's jammed. So what modern medicine and often will give you as a solution is, let's get a hammer out and just go bang, bang, bang. But you know that the key is the right key to the right lock. So what would you normally do? You would pull up the, the door a little bit and the key slips in. And this is the principle of lock and key. Now I, like you, I've been thinking often how come uh, if nature is so smart that babies still have sometimes problems making their way through the pelvis. And so that is when all the things that you say come in. And that is something that in 38 years made me go on a big, big journey trying to figure out what can I do to teach my moms to be and their partners how to counteract daily life how to use the body in the right way. And so all of that is the solution to what you were saying. And I'm sure uh, all other uh, experts will know what I'm talking about. Because uh, can I just give a scenario that all birth workers know, a woman will go to the hospital and she will say, oh, I really have contractions and I'm in pain. I'm in agony for already a whole day. And uh, <laughs> the cervix is not opening up. And you ask yourself, what's going on? And some people will say, oh, look, the woman, she's just has a low pain threshold. And you say, no, no, she has not. And the woman will go back and forth, back and forth. And usually it's what we call poor alignment of the baby in the pelvis. So that is this principle. So I agree to, to understand something about how you can use your pelvis, how you can help the baby to go in a good position is definitely one key to a good birth. Or someone has a people going, <laughs> beep, beep. Yeah. So I think time for someone else to say something. But that is truly my opinion. And I'm absolutely with you. <laughs> Very good. If mm, one of you wants to chip in, that's fine. And what uh, Gail and Jutta were saying about the pelvis, it's taken me towards Krishinda that she wanted to talk about the hormones. Yes, thank you. It's, it's, it leads right in. And when we talk about our emotions and, uh, in, in birth and, and how we feel, we have to remember that just like animals, human beings are actually animals. We are animals. And when we are in labor in particular, we really switch into that, pri that primitive, that primate brain. And just like animals need to be warm and safe and in the dark and really left to do their, their job, women are the same. And so what we find in birth is that because we are birthing in hospital situations, our hormones are being interrupted. It's such a, such a simple process. And I love teaching about this uh, to parents and, and particularly partners to appreciate that the two hormones that we really need in birth, which is our oxytocin and our endorphins, which work so well, our oxytocin gives us fantastic contractions. Our endorphins give us fantastic pain relief. But unfortunately, when we're in hospital situations, these hormones are very often disturbed because we are stimulating the wrong parts of, of the mother's brain. She's not feeling love. She's not feeling warm. She's not feeling safe. And so that beautiful flowing cascade of hormones is being interrupted and being the place is being taken. We talk about sort of lock and key. Our hormones have a lock and key mechanism that work in our brains to deliver exactly the right amount that we need. But when we overstimulate the wrong part of the, the mother's brain, 
what happens is that our adrenaline takes in, the fight flight hormones, catecholamines then follow, birth becomes unbearable, birth becomes terribly painful, contractions slow down and even stop because we remember we're primitive. So when we lived in the jungle and we started to give birth and there were wolves surrounding us because they thought, hmm, a tasty morsel's coming. We know the sound that women make. Our bodies would then emit the hormone to stop our labor so that we could move ourselves to safety. And then we would start again. We're not in jungles, we're in hospitals, but the principle is the same. When women don't feel jungle. safe. It is a jungle, you're right. And the predators, unfortunately. Civilized work in the jungle. <laughs> yeah, well, civilized is an interesting <laughs> word, isn't it? <laughs> Just a bit of sarcasm there. <laughs> no, but I mean, well, it's true. It's, probably it's, another, another thing another thing also uh, Christina is the intimacy I mean for yes. having a, a good oxytocin and uh, an endorphin uh, you need intimacy I mean uh, uh, the problem one one of the problem in the in the hospital is, is that that uh, there is uh, the, the gynecologist the midwife the assistant the and the porter that's and the, the porter the cleaner the whoever she, comes to the she's door. Exposed. Is the yes. exposed. And we know this um, from all the all the research from Michelle O'Dans, who really tells us about that. And you know, one of the really interesting things when I when I when I talk to parents and I remind them, you know, we, intimacy, absolutely, it's the love, it's the it's the safety that women need, that we allow to animals that we don't allow to women who are in labor, the constant vaginal exams, which give us very, very little information, the questions even lighting. I always like to say, you know, the hippies were right. So I'm thinking about you, Gail, back in the day when they would say, you know, mamas need to feel the love. You know, this is Ina Mae Gaskin. This is coming from, from the very beginning where they need to feel the intimacy, low lighting, absolutely feeling warm and safe and, and, and loved. Our partners can give us love, but sometimes they're even put in a position where they are feeling unsafe. And so obviously it affects how our labor goes. I remember being a, a very young midwife and writing again and again and again in women's notes, failure to progress. And that is really something that breaks my heart to this day because I realized that women never fail to progress. We fail to support them to progress. And that's a very, very basic thing that we as birth workers need to get our heads around and appreciate is that women never fail to progress. We fail them. That's very good, very good contribution, Krishinda. What you were saying about uh, the jungle and what uh, Juta was saying about uh, women going to hospital and saying, I've been such a long time this and in pain, it has brought me to thinking the same thing, is when we give birth in a safe place and when we used to give birth before going to the hospital, um, well, labor is a continuous process and, and, and the hormones would start to do their work. They realize it's the right time for this to start and they would carry on. Then, as you say, obviously there is a danger, there is something unknown and the whole process stops. The same when you're having sex, you're having sex, the phone rings and you don't know what to do if you carry on or you don't. But if it's, if it's your, I don't know, grandmother or at the door, knocking and you can see I'm going through the back door and you know it's open everything is just going to stop because what it's that's not sexy that, exactly <laughs> it's not sexy so the same thing exactly happens in birth because the hormones in uh, birth are the same hormones that uh, work in sex because both of them have the same mission it's yes, exactly, exactly the same one so when we, uh, when you start uh, being in labor and you start with pains and then what message are you telling your body? It's all of a sudden you get excited, you start giving orders, telling your partner, go and get the bag and everything ready, go and get the car, we're leaving, we're leaving, you arrive at the hospital and usually 
women find that they have to justify themselves because nothing is happening now. But Absolutely. I swear it was happening before <laughs> when I was at home and this was happening. But what happened with the body? The same example that you put with the wolves. Okay. I would like to say something. I, I was going to start and now all of a sudden this stops because I'm telling uh, crossed messages to to my body. I'm stimulating the wrong that wrong side of our brain. Yes. I would like to say something because yes, you know I totally agree on all of that because neurobiology is something I dearly love. But my question, and that is really a question to the panel, because the question is, I love home birth very much and I'm absolutely pro, but reality is most women are not going to give birth at home. And depending on which country you are, uh, there is little support for that. So I also want to uh, raise the question, and I find it a very important question. Um, how can we offer something as birth professionals, whether you're a doula, a doctor, a midwife, to create a good atmosphere, a supportive, warm atmosphere, also in a hospital? Because let's face it, in the world right now, in 2021, most women will give birth in a hospital. And you're absolutely so. right. And it's, it's not about the place. It's about the environment. Some oh. women feel safer in hospital. And so this is where they should be. But the idea is that we as professionals, if we understand the science and we understand that women need to have intimacy and they need to have these things so that they have the fantastic hormonal cascade, we absolutely have to change absolutely. our protocols I, and I, our policies. I, I, you're I absolutely fully understand right. it, yes, but that's you're why I also right. want to speak, for instance, uh, to the students I work with, because there is so many little things that will make the difference. The way you yes. welcome a woman in the hospital, mm. the way you look after her, because, you know, I worked in everything. I worked in home birth. I worked with water births in the early 90s. I worked in birth centers. I worked in big tertiary hospitals, 5,000 births, big neonatal unit. And my question was always, it's not about where you are. It's more about how you do your job and which approach exactly. and intention do you also bring to your work. And that's exactly. something all of us, for instance, there was a study in the States that showed when people at the birth have empathy the outcome is better. And that is very simple to explain because when you are nervous, because you are the first time giving birth or the second time and you go to the hospital and you're a little bit scared and right now with COVID, you're even more scared. But someone opens the door, smiles at you and says, yeah. welcome, how exciting you're going to have a baby. Come in, gives you, you know, a little back massage, shows maybe the partner, if your partner come along, how to do it. Makes the space very nice, comfortable, soft lights, is very inviting and caring. That's one key, how you can already change things in the hospital. Because to come back to Michelle Odor, that some of you might know, Michelle Odor is a well-known world, well-known obstetrician that in the 70s worked with Frederic Liboyer, who is not with us anymore. And Frederic Liboyer was a man, an obstetrician who in the 70s brought back natural childbirth to Europe. And so he was the first one to allow women to uh, give birth in any position to support uh, making sounds, dim lights, all of that. And I trained in a hospital, according to Le Boyer, a state hospital in 83. So I know there is ways how you can bring it back. I love home birth and I wish we would have more home births, but the reality is, and that's what most of us that will be here, may be probably working in a hospital environment. So how can we have a key in our hands to change what's going on for all of us. But I think you, answer, you answered your own question because really it's oh, yeah. not about, as I say, I, home birth, it's about how we energetically, how we embrace these, these women and their partners when they come into our space, wherever we are, birth center, hospital, wherever we are, at that moment when they come to the door and they're greeted with a smile and they're greeted with love and they're greeted with warmth because that immediately affects their, the hormones in their brain and lets them feel safe and lets them feel welcome. And that changes completely the experience. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, there's a saying, hugs before drugs or exactly. kissing will release oxytocin. But the thing is, it can only be a kiss that is a loving kiss. Just right. a kiss is not going to do it because then you could ask someone to come by and give you a kiss and you release oxytocin, but that's not how that works. And so, this you is know, an interesting I mean, concept. I, I remember yeah. being told as a student midwife, don't get too involved with your, your patients in, in the UK. Don't get too involved. And I thought, how can I not fall in love with these women? 
how can I not absolutely love these women in this beautiful process of the goddess? And every woman that would come to the doors of the hospital, I would greet with such love. And you immediately saw the difference in their face and, and felt the difference in their body because they felt they were was well, well supported, but supported with love and absolute confidence in the process as well. Confidence Thank in the you. process of birth. Yeah, and I... Absolutely. Sorry. Uh, carry on, uh, Tony. No, no, sorry. All right. I, I was going to say is that uh, uh, as a matter of, even if uh, uh, a birth is planned in, at home, I mean, it is very important, uh, the hospital, because you don't know if you have to, to go to the hospital. And in, then it's why I think it's that important. It's why I'm, I'm working the last years in, in hospital, trying to change the the way uh, we do things in hospitals, because uh, uh, as, as you say, it's very important how uh, she feels there, if she feels confident uh, uh, to, to release this all hormone and, and go on. And it's very important, as you say, Christina, uh, to uh, to be uh, loving with, uh, with her. I have seen, uh, as, as um, actually, I am working a lot in the, uh, uh, in the in the clinic before, I mean, the last uh, weeks before uh, uh, the, the the birth is starting, and what I have seen is uh, when I see, uh, I mean, when when we uh, show the delivery suite to a woman who is still, I mean, is not uh, in in birth, just when she goes to the clinic, sometimes I I take them to the to the delivery suite and show them how it is. Uh, um, introduce them to the midwives, and that changed a lot. She, 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 she came in with, uh, uh, I mean, with fear, with uh, te tension, and when you do that, everything is relaxed. And then uh, I have seen that how uh, a lot of women that is passing the 41 weeks and things like that, just when they see what is, uh, how is the delivery street, and how loving the, 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 the people is in there, they change, they change a, a lot. About it. Yes, I was wanted start. to... Sorry? Yeah, that I, I, I was wanted to say, and I was going actually to, to after what uh, Christina and, and Jutta were discussing, I was actually going to uh, ask you uh, about this, because I think that's the key. It's not about home birth or hospital birth. It's about the professionals knowing how to accompany birth in uh, the optimal manner. It's about empowering women and it's about that good relationship between women and professionals and between professionals themselves because yeah. if we teach midwives how important it is to be a midwife what entitles to be a midwife and what it means to be with women but we don't teach doctors and other professionals our role and what that breach between all professionals is also also really important and believe it or not we are starting to get a little bit short of time so i'm going to uh, welcome um, diane and meli because they are the ones who are going to talk to us about um, this uh, empowerment and this uh, relationship between the woman and the professionals Thank you, Irene. Is the noise okay? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just conscious. I'm, I'm not making any apology. I've one day off, so I'm by the pool. <laughs> so. We are very jealous. I think we, you are the, the, the best uh -huh. thing that we want to look at at the moment. Uh -huh. It's like, oh, yeah. look at us. It's one of us in yeah. our room and in our houses, and you with those beautiful yeah, palm trees I and know. sunshine. So if, very nice. So if the noise, if it gets too much, there's a lot of splashing. I'll move to a different place. Um, okay. Yeah, I think everybody has has made my job quite easy here. Um, because really you've, you've said everything that um, I think is key in terms of how we as, as midwives and, and all healthcare professionals who deal with women on a daily basis. Um, when, when I opened the clinic that I have in uh, Namawongo, which is in Kampala, it's in a large slum area. Um, I actually opened the clinic because of having conversations with mothers here who were terrored 
They were absolutely terrorized when they were giving birth. They had such fears. They had so many of them had lost so many babies. And their biggest fear was not the clinical prowess of the staff that were looking after them, but the fear that they had in how they were treated. And they, uh, I mean, we have a huge population of women who have obstructed labor. That's probably the biggest reason for women to have to go to theater here is obstructed labor. Um, and the, when I was naming the clinic, I named it Amani. Amani is Swahili for peaceful. And I was just so drawn by the stories of these women who talked about how they were treated in labor. Um, I'm Irish, I, I love communicating, I love talking, I talk too much, but it's so vital even for me as a midwife that I have a relationship with the mother that I am looking after. Um, for the simple reason, I think somebody, um, I can't remember who it was said it there, but somebody brought up um, about the students saying, you shouldn't get too involved. This is the biggest event of my life. I'm about to have a child. I'm about to go through one of the most dangerous processes that the human body can go through. If you think of it in, you know, theoretically, um, I have every right to, to be fearful because so many things can go wrong. But if I have that relationship with that person, I can trust that person that what she's telling me, that everything, that my body is designed to do that. Um, people have talked about intimacy. We are, we are doing the most intimate uh, assessments of these women. We are doing the most intimate practices. We are, are, so much of our work is below the belt as we speak. And, you know, when, whenever we put ourselves in that position in the hospital environment, we're in our night clothes, we have strangers coming and looking at our genitals, we have people um, hooking and poking and doing things that really uh, is very alien to us. So I think that for me, certainly here, the relationship has been crucial, not just for the mothers in my care, but how I relate to those mothers as well in terms of... Um, my best practice. If I know that a mother is trusting of what I'm telling her, if I know that she is free to call me and, and tell me that she's worried about something, knowing that I'm going to help that, again, oxytocin, all those love hormones, all those um, being hugged is just so, so important. And I think um, everybody has really, as I say, just said um, what, what is involved uh, in, terms of, in terms of sex, Irene, you were talking about um, sex and intimacy. Uh, another big issue that we have here in Uganda is that very few women are in relationships that are loving relationships. Uh, where I work, we have a lot of uh, teenage pregnancy, we have a lot of prostitution, we have a lot of rape, we have a lot of incest. And there, even in normal relationships where there is polygamy, we have a lot of polygamy. So women generally do not have an experience of being loved. And if uh, somebody did some research on my clinic um, some time ago, and whenever they were asked, why is it that you love coming to this clinic? It wasn't because Diane's a white midwife. It wasn't because she has a lovely room and lovely paint. It wasn't because she's just a brilliant midwife clinically. It was because when they come through the doors of our clinic, they feel cared for by our staff. And in four years, we have not had one maternal death and not one death of a baby, um, which in a country like this is, is really quite unique. And women come to the clinic with so much less fear and our, our referral rate is, is so much lower than so many other places because they are supported, they are loved. So I think everybody has really said all that, um, you know, all that like I was going to say. I would like to say something, Diane. I would like to say something because Oxytocin is not only a sexual hormone. Oxytocin is actually a connecting hormone. Yeah. Yeah. And so what you say is very clear to me because I know culturally there are countries where there's a lot of prostitution, poverty, many things. As you say, you know, a man are uh, looking at you may, more as a sexual object. And so I understand. But again, you know, it was the same thing I referred to when I said when you welcome someone uh, in a very friendly way and you show them. 
ah, I'm excited you are here. I'm ready to care for you. And you give them a bit of love that many of your women probably are often lacking in life, I would think. Mm. So I can just imagine that they just flower and really uh, feel safe to have their babies and feel good. And I think mm. you do a wonderful, awesome job, but you know that I respect mm, your you, work Jutta. so very much there. Yeah, because. Thank you, Jutta. But you know, it's something but, uh, everyone can learn something from. Mm. But I think as, as well, um, I mean, when I came to Uganda in the first place, I actually didn't come to be a midwife. I had left midwifery back in the UK um, because of a number of things, one of which was bullying and the amount of bullying that not only women were undergoing, but also myself as a midwife. I was in community and um, I think that was why I just loved the community so much because I had that opportunity to, to build that relationship with mothers. But, um, you know, th this whole business of, of relationships um, is just so, so vital and uh, it's, it has changed, it has changed practice so much even for me and just what I'm, what I'm offering. The ladies who um, I do the home births with, um, the majority of women that I do home birth with are, they're foreigners, so they're in a country where they know that the standards are, are very, very poor con compared to where they're coming from and their biggest fear again is is how they're going to be treated when they're in hospital. And I think even again, just having that contact with one person makes such a difference for them. And we've had some wonderful home births and even, you know, even water group, even water birth. So it's really, really important. I think what you're all talking about is continuity of care. Continuity of care. Mm -hmm. When you have a midwife or a doctor, the same one you see every month, or every every week when you get towards the end, is the guy that's got to deliver you. Sending them to a hospital, and they have doctors that sometimes they call them hospitalists now in America, where they one doctor does prenatals, and then when she goes into labor, she just goes to the hospital because the guy that's doing the prenatal doesn't have to pay high insurance. So the guy in the hospital, he's covered by hospital insurance. So th this is getting really bad. They're actually passing women off in pieces. There's no continuity of care. There's no love. The trust they had with their prenatal doctor is not the doctor that's going to deliver them. The plans that they discussed with their prenatal doctor is not the guy in the hospital going to say, well, I don't, I don't believe in any of those. You can't do birth in any position you want. The doulas in America are trained to uh, clarify what the staff is telling them to do. The doulas in America are trained not to fight for their patients. So, and a woman in labor cannot fight for herself. All the hormones, the oxytocin, all that is out the window. If she has to say, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. So Very good I have point, to tell you guys, yeah. we've got to change. We've got to change. It's got to be back to your village midwife loves that woman. She doesn't even, maybe she can't even read, but she can love. Oh. And she's got experience of catching 40 or 50 babies for the village. And can I, can even I the that? World Health Organ, yeah, but the World Health Organization says, oh no, we've got to send trained five-year midwives who's got a master's degree in midwifery, never done an out-of-hospital birth, send her yeah, to a village. She doesn't want to go to the this, village. That's yeah, that is the, that is such an important point because there's that real kind of power structure as well, even within midwifery. And as Diane said, the bullying, student midwives. It's, 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 it's rampant and it's not just in the States, it's not just in the UK. I know I have had students from Germany, I've had students from all over and Spain as well. And it's that real kind of, almost as if we're trying to teach midwives to separate from their humanity, separate from their heart, separate from, the, from that energetic love for the woman so that they can become clinical professionals. And this is we need, birth, really, really we need birth centers. We need birth centers like Diane, where all you have to do is love those women. And, and yes, you have to know a few things for the for the 2% that are going to get into trouble. If you can love a woman to, to birth, she will birth. It's like, mm. like you talked about orgasms, for goodness sakes. I'm still so passionate about birth because that's my spiritual orgasm. When that baby comes out, <laughs> when that baby comes out and looks at me, and, and I see the mother's joy on her face and those little bitty baby eyes look at me like it's like God in the universe is blessing me. I'm not yeah. a religious person, but I'm addicted to that spiritual orgasm feeling and I can't yeah. get it unless I give it to you first. 
Yes. It's true. <laughs> oxytocin is, as I usually say, oxytocin is contagious. And that's one of the wonderful things of being a midwife and that your life is accompanying uh, women giving birth, that you go home with a little bit of that oxytocin. You get your oxytocin high because that's what it happens is like it's it's the hormone of love is the hormone of being happy of sharing of and it just goes from one person to another i know this can is I just, super in sorry, sorry just can moment. i just say yeah go ahead go 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 diane sorry i was, I was just saying I've been single for 18 years. My birth work and the work that I do with my women is my only dose of oxytocin I get in life. <laughs> and I would say that's plenty, Diane. Not that it's I'm, so much, but... it's so much. I don't need any men in my life. <laughs> so I, I still do. I, I still do. Oh, no, I give up. I'm I sure we up. can discuss this a little bit later <laughs> amongst us because the people who are looking at us are yeah. saying like, there are still people who haven't talked in this uh, panel and because we're talking about this I want to uh, let Melly talk to us about what she wanted to share with us. Melly? Where is Melly? Your, your mic, Melly, your mic is, is off. Uh, Said, you need to... Okay, Said, you, need, okay. Listen to okay. Me. you listen to me now? Connected. Yeah. Yes. Connected, yeah. Such an interesting talk. So, so thank you so much, so much, because when I was educated as a midwife, they always told me this, Krishinda, don't get too close to women. You can't be like so influenced by it, but how can I not do it? You know, that's a lie. That's the, like the lie of the image of the um, midwives and doctors, like being aseptic. We are not aseptic, of course. <laughs> and everybody that, that says that we are, they lie. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not like purely objective, sterile. No, I, how can I stay like away from uh, a woman's birth when I'm going to, uh, to assist it? I want to talk also about, uh, yes, uh, most of women in the world, they give birth in hospitals nowadays. And um, the, the, the thing is, how do they get to the hospital? How do we manage in the systems, in the health systems, uh, childbirth education, um, motherhood education. Do you think we need to be educated or we are prepared, we are women, we gave birth to complete mother, uh, humanhood. <laughs> uh, we, we as humanhood, we are like the product of millions and millions of uh, home births. We know how to birth. Our pelvis knows how to move. But of course, we are so conditioned, socially and culturally conditioned, to be um, laid down, to do as they tell us. This is very, very violent. If we bring, bring pre peace in birth also, uh, lots of things, there won't be like failure to progress, so many failure to progress because there's failure of patience failure of listening and to give power of birth to women we are the real uh real ones who have this power and this uh authority it's like especially in i live in spain and in spain we still have a system with this very patriarchal educational system uh sanitary uh, health system and all the time like they put the power out of us they put the power and the decisions out of us. We don't have a choice to decide. So in a moment, with a big uh, emotional, um, I don't know how to say, with a big emotional stress, like having a child we have here in Spain, maybe one, two, three, two children, they say, oh, you now you can decide. How can I decide here if I was educated all my life for no deciding? Do I have the right to decide? Sometimes I told this when I, in hospital, I tell women, they ask me, which position shall I stay? And I say, position you want, you can choose, you can, of course, don't ask me. You can uh, put yourself in the position, I will be on my knees, I will be on the floor. Uh, and they say, can I, they, they are very surprised and they say, uh, can I do this? Of course, of course you can do it. And that's also the reason of the success of home birth. Because as you were talking of continuity of care, also they have uh, 
they know that they are deciding, they feel at ease, they feel at home because they are at home. So at hospitals, we have to make women feel at home. And uh, like if they really, because this is also uh, in law in Spain that they can decide unless there is a very, very big issue of uh, death or, or very big issue of urgent issue, they can decide wherever they want. But most professionals, they don't have like this. They didn't assume this. They assume that the woman of all the time also when someone arrives and they, she doesn't want a pedido, but why is she, why is she screaming? Offer her the pedido, but why? Because uh, yeah, labor suits and labor words, they should look more like this, like a concert and not like, Everybody in the night is sleeping, quiet, laying on their backs, of course, with a mobile pelvis, no moving pelvis. So I think that's the big issue. But of course, we are so conditioned, you know, that uh, we have this big conditionment that if we don't lay in the backs, we cannot uh, give birth any, anyhow else. And so that's the big point. That's the big point. We call it... Uh, you know, work with an association we like as childbirth educators and we call it, uh, I don't know how it'd be in English, but it'd be something like... Birth is ours? This, yeah? Birth, no, birth is, is ours? ours. It, it'll no. be like, we, our classes are called like this deep preparation or anti-preparation for... <laughs> 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 We call it like in Spanish, in most of uh, health centers, they call it preparación al parto, like you have to be prepared for birth. So with these classes, they are like deep preparation, anti preparation You don't have to, we don't have to tell you any, teach you anything because you already know it. You are prepared. And yes. most of the, of this child, childbirth education in some, uh, some clinics here in Spain, they are like preparation for uh, submission, you know, yes, for being a patient, not for yes. I think, patient, I think, yes, 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 yes that's, that's the thing. Melly, I think you're highlighting here a very, very important thing that is, we are hearing from different oh. countries, different experiences, and we are hearing exactly the same, the same uh, words. Uh, Leila is waiting to talk to us about the situation in India and Iran, and I'm sure she's going to, uh, probably she won't surprise us very much with uh, what she's going to say. But I think the base of this comes that women have, since they are born, they've been trained, to be good girls, to be quiet, to just don't make people angry and just try to take in whatever they're told. So we are used to be treated badly, let's say. I'm not saying that all professionals treat badly. That's not what I'm trying to say. But we are so used to whenever you say something wrong, no, 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 no you be a good girl, you shut up. So when we actually find a professional that is loving what um, Diane was saying in Uganda, that how women love her clinic, that what Melly, what each one is saying, then it's like, seriously, I, I, I can choose? How is this part? I mean, I am we are surprised. We are surprised because we are being treated well. And we are surprised because we are given back the power of what, what birth is about. We are given the power of what is happening in our own bodies. And a lot of women are not prepared uh, for this because... It might be even the first time that has happened uh, in their lives. And I think, and that was why the meaning of this uh, panel discussion was, was how to build that bridge between women and professionals, how to tell professionals that it's not, they are above and the women are uh, in the bottom and they just say, and they just take, but we actually have to, go like this, to put it like this, because each woman is different. Each, each woman has her own individual needs. And we need to train professionals to understand that they've got the knowledge, they can help a lot, but we need to remove that 
and balance and that huge difference that is um, happening. Uh, Leila, dear, would you like to thank you. tell us yeah, a little bit? Sure, thank you. Sure, thank you so much. Thank you from uh, my professional team. I'm so proud of you when I hear your story and how much fear and hero you are. I really, really can't believe that such a fantastic angels got brought to our team. Uh, actually, I'm a representative from Asian countries here. What I have worked and experienced in different countries in these 20 years, in UAE, Arab countries, in Asia countries like Iran, Georgia, uh, Georgia, I mean that Asia part of Georgia, and Turkey, or now in India, the first thing is that there is not, there's not enough autonomy for midwives to work and uh, to be individual really. Even in, in, the, in Iran with 45,000 midwives, they have to work under the senior gynecologist and obstetrician. So obstetrician, they have their own rights because everything happened for the mothers. They are the ones who are responsible for legal, illegal, illegal or legal issue and they have to go to answer for the court. The other thing I found in other countries like UAE and in uh, Asian countries like India or in, even in Turkey, they don't have enough midwife to uh, keep them. They have shortage of even nurses who can work independently. Plus, the second thing is that how we can open our birth, uh, birth centers is not allowed in some countries because birth centers need high speed ambulance. In some places we have a very congested and very crowded population like Delhi in India. How we can help the mother in emergency cases to send her to the hospital to get help from professionals. The other thing that I want to know, the most important thing, how we make this connection between professional, between advice, and between obstetrician. Because they both are in the same boat. They both, they are passionate about the birth. They, I'm sure most of them, they like to have safe birth for their mothers and clients. But the problem is legal issue and this is the clients. Because I experienced that. In UAE, we didn't have midwife. We trained 45 midwife. They became as a practitioner nurse midwife but they were not allowed to work in private sector as an individual midwife. They had to work again and come back to nurse position and work as a nurse under supervision of gynecology. So gynecologists and obstetricians, they don't let them to do whatever they like because they say it is our responsibility and we have to go to court for any problem happen. Now in India, I started to, uh, for, uh, we started some labor suite and we started aquanatal uh, plus uh, water birth, but we cover our midwifery job because they were saying that if it didn't happen, we will be engaged with families, we will be engaged with court, and even some people, some families, they don't let us even reach to court. They will come and we will get um, some, uh, unfortunately, even some attack. So what we should do? What is our role as a midwife? Yeah, we have in some countries like Iran, we have many midwives. We have 50,000 midwives, more than bachelor degree post-graduation midwife. In some country like UAE, we don't have midwife. In some country like India, with 1.2 million population, and this much birth rate, we don't have midwife. Even the nurses are very well qualified nurses, but they cannot work as an autonomy midwife. I want to hear from you how we can make it because we are here to help uh, Asian countries. We are here uh, to shake our hand and join in this team to help and serve Asian countries. What is your uh, suggestion? And Dr. Antonia, I want to hear from you as a representative of obstetrician how we, ma we can make, how we can come through that. Thank you so much. Okay, I mean, um, the, the problem, I think the problem here is a problem of uh, how the society is, is, is built, okay? Uh, what I mean is uh, uh, patriarchy is not just uh, the supremacy of men over women. It's also a construction of vertical, uh, construction of soci society, okay? What I mean, uh, when, uh, when a, a woman go to the hospital for a birth, 
it, it is not seen like a normal uh, uh, person, uh, a healthy person who is going to have a, a baby. It's seen as a, as a, um, she, she's seen as a patient that is going to be healed. I mean, the conception, if, if you can see in most of the countries, the delivery suites are mostly like, as a, like, a, like a operating feeders, okay? And everything is organized like if uh, it was, uh, a, a, there was a problem, there was an illness and we have to cure it. And then uh, what you are saying about, uh, about the obstetrician being the, the one who, who are responsible if there something happens, it is something that is import, very important to change, but it's not in our hands, actually. It is a political thing. But in Spain, in 2002, there was a law, a new, a new law in, in that year, that uh, uh, is called the uh, Ley de Autonomía del Paciente, uh, the, the patient autonomy law. And uh, they say, uh, in one part of, the, of that law says that uh, from that moment on, the responsibility is not vertical. It's not the doctor, the midwife, the auxiliary, is horizontal, okay? Now, in the law in Spain, is uh, uh, each one has responsibility um, for his or her work, okay? What you do. If there is a problem, it can be sued the, the doctor, but can be sued the midwife, and the doctor is not responsible unless uh, he has act, okay? Then it is that excuse is not uh, working anymore. But even so, our mind, our uh, education, uh, makes us to uh, to continue uh, thinking the same. I am all every day, almost every day, saying to my colleagues that no, that they are not responsible uh, for the work of the midwife. The midwife is responsible for uh, her her or his work. Then it is very important to change that, to to try to um, to have a more fluid relationship. And with in between the, the different professionals that are involved in 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 the in the, in the delivery, and even with the, with the woman, because if you put the woman like a patient that uh, you have to heal, I mean, then you are putting uh, uh, you are um, uh, taking off her uh, responsibility. You are uh, in fine. In, how do you say in English uh, to to uh, like this? If, if she was a child, you know what I mean? We are uh, trying to save her. I mean, the mentality in the in the in hospitals, in most of the hospitals are that we have to save the woman who is having the, the delivery because it, there is a lot of danger, we have to save her. And then it is a problem of conception, okay? A problem of, uh, uh, it is very, um, uh, it is uh, very introduced in, in, in society. Even when, when a woman wants to, for example, to, to have a delivery at home, one of the main problems are uh, the, the relative that say to her that, uh, that she has to go in the hospital because she's going to be uh, well, uh, she's going to, to be taken care. And there are professionals who know, who know who, what uh, she has to do, what has to happen, and she doesn't know anything, okay? She's not a doctor, she's not a midwife, so she doesn't know anything. Uh, 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 passing, I mean, not uh, taking account that is her body who is going to, to have uh, to have birth, and her body uh, is built, as uh, Gail uh, said uh, earlier, is built for having the baby. I mean, it's not necessary to 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 do uh, anything. I mean, there is a, a say that I have uh, I have heard that uh, for a delivery uh, you just need. Uh, three things: the woman, the baby, and a tree to hold. <laughs> okay, uh, there's nothing, nothing else we, we need. Uh, then, well, uh, if there is a complication, there is a problem. Then uh, there, there, there are professionals who can do things, who can help, and even sometimes, very little, but sometimes you can even save uh, some lives. But it is just when there is uh, there are complications. Okay, and then. Uh, what are you saying, uh, Lily? I think uh, the the best way to do it will be uh, first uh, starting by a political thing. I mean, to change laws 
So uh, doctors are not responsible. They can they can say no. I have you have to do what I, I am saying because I am responsible. If something happens, I am going to be sued. That is very important to uh, to change because it's not it's difficult. In the other hand, it's very important the training. I mean, I don't know if I uh, um, I was lucky when I was uh, doing my training in, in the United Kingdom, but because what uh, Diane said uh, uh, earlier. Uh, probably, uh, well, no, sorry, Christina, I think it was, how uh, it happened, uh, all this happens to in the UK, but I was, uh, I was uh, uh, told that uh, it was very important to um, the respect. I mean, they, I, 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 was, uh, I was told that if you are going to, as an SHO, as a, um, say, uh, junior, as a doctor. junior doctor, junior doctor, a junior doctor, if you go into the delivery suite, you have to knock the door first, okay, and present yourself, even in the beginning of the, of the process, so you don't interrupt the process uh, uh, later. It's important that you are known by the, by the woman and there is confidence, okay. Uh, it's not like uh, I'm a doctor who go into the delivery room to save everything and to to say to everyone who, uh, what they have to do okay and it's, it is very important education it is very, very important uh, as i say politics education and then uh, uh, it, it is very important to to um, to be aware that it's not what is uh, what we are um, the important thing here is not your ego but it is to facilitate a process. It is a process, a normal process, a physiological process, and you have to facilitate it, okay? It is very important, all the professionals that are involved in it first. Yes, it's very important that uh, just be involved only the professionals that are needed in that moment. I mean, sometimes it just leaves the, the woman with probably the, uh, the, the person who is uh, helping her, uh, her partner or whatever, uh, to leave them alone. I mean, it's not necessary to be there all the time. When it is necessary, it can be one person. Probably you need a, um, an, an anesthetic doctor. Then it is very important to respect all, all that and everyone has to, uh, has to have uh, their uh, responsibility and, and, and work uh, with, with the others uh, from the respect, okay? It is very important. Thank you very much, Tony. I think you've highlighted very important things there. And the main one is that this is a multi-factor way. And this is the reason why we are all here together, trying to see how we can improve uh, birth and how we can optimize birth. Of course, in each country, they all have their own differences. But in everyone at the end of the day is a woman giving birth that has been trained to uh, be a good girl and just take things in. So she needs the empowerment for that. She needs education. Then there is the individual professionals, each one of them, no, that we each, each one of us can do so much individually, just the way you treat the your clients and the people you're looking after. And of course, the biggest change, which is the political change and, and what you were saying about hierarchy, when we don't work as a team, horizontal team, but there is the super boss and that super boss is not the woman who is given birth. That's what the main problem is. So it will be fantastic that we had a, an, an answer for uh, Leila's question, but the answer is so multifactorial. And the problem is because it's so multifactorial, changes take a lot of time and a little change takes for many people to do it takes a long, long time. So just imagine this huge change, how much it's going to take. And I think that's exactly and precisely why we're here, trying to capacitate people, upskill people, make them aware of this. How are we going to build those bridges between the women and the professionals and with the professional uh, themselves? Uh, Meli wanted to talk and uh, Juta comes yes. after. Sorry. Uh, 
uh, imagine if it is difficult that uh, this law I was talking about in Spain was, uh, was uh, I mean, it was made in, in two, 2002. It's almost 20 years and still yes. most of the professionals don't know it, don't act like that. They act like if it was a vertical uh, responsibility, not a horizontal responsibility, how it is now since 20 years ago. It's a law for 20 years and still still they are working the, the same way they were working before that. Yeah, uh, Dr. It's... Antonio, sorry, one, just one a small uh, point I want to tell you. Even we have the same law in Iran because 50,000 midwives, we have equal population of midwives with gynecologists as office of obstetrician. But the only things, uh, money talks, because hospital shareholders are only gynecologists and obstetrician. And they ignore this uh, rule because they say, if you want to bring your birth in my hospital, you have to work under me. And you have share your uh, income with me. And you have all the rules according to what I order you. They don't share, if, if they don't even sell this hospital share to midwives. That's why, that's why some countries like Iran that they have, they have midwife, they have that problem. Some countries like India, yeah, we have to start some training for doctors and gynecologists are very welcoming and they like to know about midwifery. In India, they are very broad minded and they are open to learn. Uh, but in some countries like UAE as well, because we are working there according to UK standards. Still, we could not make midwifery clinics because we don't have enough midwifery and we, the people are not aware about midwifery rule. They think everything is the hand of obstetrician and very high uh, because they are thinking about luxury lifestyle and luxury lifestyle is in the hand of doctors. Sorry, I, I'm very sorry that I'm trapped at you, Irene. I'm no, very sorry. No, no, sorry, sorry. no worries. You were the one who made the question, so uh, it was... Oh, back can I you. answer that? Can I answer the question? Um, I, I'm so used to practicing on my own, but it's easy. You find one loving doctor like Antonio, one loving, each midwife finds one loving doctor and you feed him. Money talks, money changes them. You find a doctor that's kind and that you like and you have a relationship and you flirt with him. I was taught this <laughs> by an obstetrician. I said, how do I get a backup doctor? And he said, Gail, you're a woman. Tell us where need is. Tell us we're wonderful. Flirt with us. So I did. It was easy. You, you, I, the first thing I did, I was a brand new midwife. I just went and said, look, I, sometimes I have a lady that I'm worried about and I might want to refer her to somebody. And could you at least give me an ultrasound and all that? And he'd say, well, I don't know. I, you know, uh, well, he says, okay. So I paid him for the ultrasound and then the lady met him. And slowly over the years, he became part of my team. And so my people would see him three times in the pregnancy, one for the ultrasound about, look at the cute little baby and everything's fine. And he'd rejoice and I'd say how wonderful he is. And then when, if I needed to transport, I transported to him. And I told everybody else that wasn't ready for home birth, I got this doctor that he's on my team. I'm not on his team. He's on my team. And I just got two more here in Belize last week. How did I get them? I gave them a container of hospital supplies That's... for their private clinic that we're setting up. It's easy. Uh, money talks. It's, well, not only money talks, because I don't think it's just about money. <laughs> okay, but I think flirting it's, talks. It, flirting. I was, <laughs> yeah, I was, it was that bit of oxytocin uh, going, coming and, and forward. Uh, but yes, this is what we're talking about at different levels. Each one of us, yes, how can we do everything this as a group and a society? Fantastic. But each individual person has a lot of power to try and change this and try to get people to come where they want them to be. And obviously that is also a two-sided thing, but we are here talking about how to improve the care women are getting. So yes, that's a very good example of, of, of what we're discussing. Thank can you, I, Can I just say uh, one thing? Uh, also, I'm just going to let Me Meli talk because uh, I'm she's sorry. just... Yeah, and then after Juta, Christine the talks. No, okay. Diane has been up for a long time. I don't have. Okay. It's okay. 
Go, Meli, go. You were the first one who okay. asked me ages ago. Had, had option. I was saying it in private, sorry. Uh, yes, as, as you said, um, Tony, I was going to answer to you also, Leila. Uh, this, when I arrived to healthcare, it like it surprised me because I was in another, I mean, I had another profession, I was an actress, and I was surprised by this guerrilla hierarchy and by this military or army system. It looked like me, like the army, this vertical. So this has to change, like it's a, it's a complete change of complete point of view, uh, like this is not an army. No, it's not a military system. It's a community. Not because we, we are hippie, because but we because we are co-responsible for this. And as you said, Gail, I think we put women in the center. And then when you put you put women in the center of the hierarchy, like dissolves, because you see what's really important, and that they, there is a co-responsibility in this. And uh, as you said, Tony. Uh, and also, Leila, for you, uh, this concept of luxury, for me now, a luxury can be uh, being treated by one, having a continuity of care for one single midwife. Like this, this uh, in some countries, we still have this concept of luxury if we are like treated by a doctor, of course, a man normally, and a midwife, midwives normally we're still, uh, most of us, we are women or nurses or even like secretaries that write down the doctor says, no, 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 this concept has, has to change completely. And I think in some countries we still have like to, uh, as you said, Irene authority and Tony authorities, all the community like to change this concept of luxury. And uh, what is luxury in birth? That you have lots of uh, uh, ultrasounds and lots of technology, or just that you have an empowered woman. That's that's the real luxury. So I think there has to be like a big effort in education for changing this concept in all levels, like authority, um, administration, uh, health uh, workers, and also um, all the population. So that was it. Thank you very much. Uh, Juta? No, Diane is hands is okay. up all Diane? the time. Mm, thank you, Juta. Um, I, I just wanted to make a very brief point on a, a point that Lily made some time ago about ambulances. Um, and I think what we've got to be very careful with, and, and I tend, I'm going to disagree with, with Gail a little bit and what she was saying there about, um, about paying doctors. Um, that, is, that is one of the reasons why in this particular country, so many women are dying is because doctors are so accustomed to people paying them bribes for good care. And I personally, I have good doctors that I sent my mothers to, um, but they get paid the price that they're due to be getting paid if it's in an emergency. But I think it's about teaching uh, midwives to think outside the box. So when we have, um, when we have a mother in our care, uh, our care, our, our role as a midwife is not just about, as they are taught here, a, a midwife is somebody who delivers babies. That's all they do. Yeah, they can pull the baby out of the hole, but they can't, they're not actually <laughs> trained to deal with it. That's literally what they're taught. I had this conversation with one of my new midwives recently. She has no idea about either side of actually physically pulling that baby out of a mother. That is what they are taught to do. And beyond that, they're not. So when you come into talking about uh, Lily, I totally agree with you about the ambulances, um, certainly in India. It's all very well building up these networks, but these, but these services, they cost money. And in a culture like what I'm working in, um, the biggest problem is the corruption and the amount of money that is being charged to get these very basic systems. So our role as midwives, certainly for in my eyes, is that we are networking with those people outside, slightly outside of our comfort zone and trying to bring them into our team in terms of, of building that network so that we can go into the slums and get ambulances to mothers. I have a car at three o'clock in the morning. I don't get an ambulance. I have to put the mother in an emergency in my car and drive to the hospital. So, you know, it's, I, I, I'm totally agreeing with what uh, Lily said there just about the ambulances and um, the fact that there has to be finances behind this. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was, that was me. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. Sorry, I didn't see you there asking That's for. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Even that you asked me being, that, that you wanted to be unmuted. I'm being very good putting my hand up. <laughs> I don't know how to take it off now. <laughs> I, I, cannot I cannot see all of oh, you. It so will go off by itself, Diane. Jutta, there okay. you go. So 
I want to add in, because I've been much in Asia. Uh, I've been 15 times to India, four times to Nepal. When I look at the picture, I actually agree with Diane. I can see the problem, sorry, don't be offended, of corruption. Because in many countries of the world, corruption is a number one problem. And I've worked with many doctors from India and Africa when I worked in New Zealand in a big hospital. And when I lived in Australia, the same. So I think there's different aspects to the whole story. One thing is to raise consciousness, because here in Berlin, I work with many expats, and I don't go to births anymore. I do education. But many of my Indian clients, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, American, Swedish, Greek, wherever people come from, have a good birth experience. Partners come to the birth, and they will be news bringer to all their families back in India, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh. So that is one thing. So one has to use them as a positive force, I have to say, to bring new ideas back to their countries and to change what people believe is how you give birth. Because sorry to say, there is something I call birth culture. And birth culture is what we see in movies, what we think is true. And we know Hollywood, Bollywood is a big fat lie. It's not true, but we believe it. Yeah. So there is different uh, places where we start. And then we have to find, like uh, Diane said, we have to find people for whichever reason they want to help us. Maybe some want to be famous, as you know, well known as I'm the good doctor that, you know, has a good name. And I believe, to be honest, there is good people everywhere in the world. We just have to find them and get around yes. this corruption and say, please, this is the idea and it will help. And that is something you can always bring to the table. The topic is public health. Because, you know, you look at a country like India, so many people are born there. You want to uh, have a better public health and a good birth is a start into a good health. There is no doubt when you talk about many things, microbiome and so on and so on. So you can say you can save the system some money. You can enhance public health. You can uh, bring someone in good publicity. Yeah. And so I think you have to pull on many strings. And yes, Irene, it's a big job. I agree. And it's not going to happen overnight, but I truly believe when in the 70s, Le Boyer stood up in front of all those obstetricians in Europe and said, well, I want women to sing at the birth. I want to have semi-dark lights. I want to have partners at birth. I want babies to be born gentle. He was a kind of a nuisance to many people as well. And he still did it. I mean, I was trained in a state hospital and we were breathing babies out in semi-dark lights at candlelight in a hospital. Yeah, just so to say in 83, doing full rooming in. So when that is possible anywhere, it's possible everywhere. And I just think we need to find people that are up for that, whether it's nurses that want to change into midwifery, whether it's doulas that want to help, whether it's obstetricians that say, well, I'm up for new ideas. I also care for when my wife is pregnant, I want her to have a good birth experience. I want her to smile afterwards and strengthen my partnership with her. So it's a, it's a general topic about how do we build a society and how do we live in a society? So we have to find friends everywhere and the friends together will change the whole picture. And that's truly my belief. And that's all I wanna say. Exactly, thank you very much, Jutta. That was a very good contribution. That's, that's so true, exactly. Each one of us can contribute and all of us together can just get more and more people on board and we will uh, change the, the way uh, people are um, looked after and the way people are born. Uh, Krishinda, I'm just going to let Krishinda talk because she asked for it a while ago and then... Uh, uh, sorry, I I'm was... Just... Uh, one moment, sorry, just I was uh, translating question of the Iranian uh, midwife. That was the question from them. That's why you answered very well. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Very good. I, that's, I was also going to say that now we are going to uh, open our questions and uh, answers. So just type in your questions and we will just uh, try to do our best to answer okay, one them. More. Can, can and, I translate in Persian and Arabic? Uh, Krishinda, please. Uh, can I translate in three minutes in Persian and Arabic? Because they are asking me to translate. They don't know what we are going to talk about. Can I just tell them? Do Sana Aziz Fiction? Yeah, please. Do Sana Aziz and Sati Porsche Show Possible? Me to need so a lot to know Benevisin. Okay, in Farsi, Inglisi, Arabi, Hachi, Hosin, Benevisin, and Barson Solas to Tajam, Mimikona, Betun, Inglisi, Jabo, Midan, Badan, Poyan, Baron, Memo, Yabaron, Hos, Fashion, Iranian, Miseriman, Tajam, Asho, the Farsi, Baroton, Hamaro, Mia, Mercy, Rosfan Benevisin to Chatbot. Thank you. Sorry.
So, yeah, I was just going to carry on from, from Juta and, and everybody else. And one of the things that I really think is so important as well is we're talking about making changes from the top and from the middle, but also remember that education starts with young people. Yeah. And I've been so lucky to go into schools, into high schools. And I actually went into a high school in, in, in Barcelona, in my, in my daughter's high school, and taught about home birth and, and taught about birth to a group of high school students. I actually showed a film of one of the moms that I had giving birth. And it was such an interesting experience because it starts with young women and it starts with young men, young men understanding that birth is normal, young women understanding that they have rights and choices over their bodies, because these are the people who grow up to then vote and make laws. They change the future. So ideally, this is also so important, even if we start with very, very small children um, in a lot of the Northern European countries, sex and birth is talking about very openly. And I think we really need to encourage this in a very you know, understanding way, depending on which culture we're in, but definitely educating young people that even before they're having sex, that sex leads to birth. And this is how women birth and what women need when they birth. So that as they grow up and as they take charge, they become doctors, they become midwives, they become politicians, they actually understand how birth works. Because human biology, real birth isn't taught to young people. And we, we really, as midwives, can get into those spaces as well and, and give that type of education to the, to the new birthing families. Fantastic. Thank, thank you very much, Krushinda. Uh, we're just going to um, open the uh, questions uh, uh, now. Um, but Obviously, many of you might be thinking, OK, we can see what the problem is and you are all telling us the different perspectives from every place in the world or many, obviously not every. And why are we doing this? We have had this idea of coming together in this um, Lily Excellence Center to put together many obstetrics professionals, each one of them experts in their own field, a lot of uh, them with years and years of experience. And we actually want to upskill and capacitate uh, nurses and midwives and doctors in their, uh, their countries where they want us. We are developing uh, several trainings, uh, mainly uh, midwifery training for several months where we, the uh, experts you can see here, will be uh, delivering uh, this training. We will be, uh, we've designed the curriculum and we will be delivering uh, the training. Uh, that would be an online training, obviously, because of the situation we have at the moment. We cannot travel very soon, but it will also be a training in uh, C2 when we can actually uh, go there and, and provide this training. So I just wanted you to know that this is what we're doing and you can get in contact with us if uh, this is of interest to any of you. And do we have any questions? I guess, Leila, some people were send us some questions before. I don't know if you're translating. Your mic, were, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. They were. Uh, I had some Indian friends. She asked me that uh, if we want to start it in India, we are doula and we have any physiotherapist doctors here. That we are so interested to develop uh, birth educating, and they are keen to have some. Uh, they keen to develop even aquanatal and antenatal care. So. I hope uh, we can have some answer for them. Thank you. Anyone want to? Okay. Yes, of course. Juta? Oh, yeah, certainly. I mean, that would be sort of an easy thing. Antenatal care. But, you know, it depends. Can I say when you are a doula or a physiotherapist, there is a certain limit, I believe, uh, that is possible in antenatal care. Because again, on a, sorry, on a legal point of view, real, uh, okay, medical antenatal care belongs into the hands of a midwife or doctor, I think, yeah, and there's a difference. But still, there is many things that you can do antenatally to really prepare a woman for the birth. 
And that can be very extensive, whether, you know, it's uh, certain exercises to help the pelvis to align, uh, massages, many, many things. I mean, that will certainly be part of the training as well. I mean, this, this training or whatever you're looking for is going to be extended to birth workers in general, because it is, again, as I said before, especially in countries where there is no midwifery care, it is everyone pulling in one uh, direction. And that can be all people that are involved with a pregnant woman. It can be a doctor, a physiotherapist. Yeah, there's many things. I don't know how your um, possibility is here for aqua trainings. This I don't know. So I'm not familiar how many pools we have in India. Should be easy. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. We've done in North India as well. And we did many aquanatal training, even with the couples. It was a very successful project. And uh, I guess even for aquanatal training, we don't have that much strict rules for me, midwife and any other healthcare to work on that. It, they can even, even physiotherapists can do, but you know, physiotherapist doctor just they are looking for some short course of midwifery to develop their skills and experience that they can cover mothers during uh, antenatal care in the pool. And the other things about doulas uh, who are working as a doula in, in India and they are looking for that, uh, I guess they can uh, come with us and uh, get uh, some short training as offline, online and uh, hands-on training in India even. We have the place to make this uh, physical training and uh, we are trying to help them even. It, it's hands-off job. So, if, yes. We... We definitely, I think we can train everyone in their field of expertise. So doulas, yes, we are the right people to upskill doulas and help her uh, develop their work better. Uh, we could, yes, help them about uh, aquanatal and, but not only that, but every, and with physiotherapists, I think it's exactly the same. If they do have uh, an interest in how, uh, to look after women during the pregnancy, the pelvic floor, uh, the postnatal exercises, all the ailments that women can happen during, can have during pregnancy. And obviously physiotherapy is the best uh, way because they cannot take medicines. It's not safe for them to take medicines. So we could, of course, develop a course for either of them or any other professionals that involves what we are experts in caring for uh, women during uh, birth, pregnancy, and the postpartum period. Sure. Yeah. Uh, we have some uh, Arabic, uh, mid Arabic midwife. She's asking that what do you advise for making the progress of the labor in uh, SPD, even gynecologists or even midwife, how they can make it fast. I, I would, I'm just going to say one thing and I will let others see if they've got a different opinion. How can they make it fast? Give the power to the woman, let her put herself in the position she wants to be, her body's guiding, her body's telling her exactly what to, to do. And what usually stops the process is stopping that flow of hormones, is putting her in a position that she doesn't want to be. So just let her guide what is happening. Let her guide the process. Yeah. And I think the important yeah. thing is yeah. that, that it doesn't have to be speedy. There's nothing yeah. in the book that says that birth yeah. has to be speedy. It says the woman exactly. is laboring and it says she's comfortable to cope with, with the pain and all that's happening in her body. You speed it up, that's where they lose control. We don't have microwave birth. We don't have microwave birth. We have birth that takes the time that it needs to take. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, take away the clock of the time. I understand that sometimes yeah. we wish for a speedy birth, but you know, some women will give birth in just 45 minutes and some will take a whole day. But you know, I believe it's a bit like, have you ever walked up a high mountain? I hiked up once to Annapurna Base Camp in Nepal. I met a guy who was running up the mountain and he did it in just four days. It took me 12 days, but it was a very enjoyable trip, a trip I think back yeah, uh, you know, 27, 28 years ago, I did that. So which, which uh, hike up Mount Everest, uh, or sorry, Adapurna was better? The one, the guy who was running quickly, taking a picture and then running back down. And I met him on the way down. I said, wow, you're done already? He said, of course. And he was running. But me, I took so many pictures and have great vivid memories. So sorry, who took uh, uh, the right to take a clock and say, this is how long a birth takes? Everyone uh, takes the 
when when somebody asks that question, my first would be, why are you asking? What what's your concern about a fast first? It is she talking about the doctor having the clock? Is she talking about her fear of long term pain? Is she talking about uh, a past experience? So I I think before we can even answer the question, you I would have to clarify. You're asking me how to can I speed up or make the birth fast, and I need to know where she's coming from with that question because there's many answers to it. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 would have, I would have emphasized that uh, uh, what uh, uh, Sinda said, uh, sorry, uh, Jutta said that uh, uh, to uh, switch off the, the clock, okay? Don't worry about, about the clock. I mean, to speed, uh, to try to speed uh, a delivery um, repair is delay is related. I mean, if, if, you, try, if you try to, to speed it up, what you are doing actually is to slow it down. I mean, to stop it. Uh, then it is, it is very, very, every woman has uh, its, uh, its way to have the, the, the delivery and we have to respect that. Probably this question, I think, I don't know, I can't be, be sure, but probably this question is uh, all about that curve that, uh, mm, you know, how they teach us that uh, one centimeter every, every, I don't know, I forgot the, the, the speed that they said that uh, has to be like that. I mean, Every every delivery is different. Sometimes the 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 process stop. It's normal. Take a break and then start again. It's not a problem. I mean, as far as there is not any complication, this is not a problem. There is not no time for for that. Okay, this is important. Me, uh, I think yeah. Tony, it's a very valid question though because it's there. I think so many people that are working in the hospital uh, situation. That's what they are taught. And it's, you know, even the simple partograph, we use the, the WHO partograph here. They have their action line, they have their alert line and their action line. If you don't, if you don't stay on the alert line and you hit the action line, then you have to act. But actually th there's no reason to act, as you say, as, as long as everything's okay. So it's a really good question, I think, coming from, is she a student that asked? No, no, she's midwife. And if one oh, of what gynecologists, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, we have midwife okay. and gyne gynecologists both together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because uh, they want a true aspect of physiologic and optimal birth to hear about that. We have one question that you're asking, what is your suggestion for this uh, and uh, except symphys pubis uh, techniques and Mac Robert, what you advise for uh, labor dystocia? What, sorry? Labor dystocia. The baby is in dystocia situation. Yeah, and yeah. we are doing uh, symphys pubis, uh, symphys pubis uh, ah. techniques. Shoulder and dystocia. Shoulder yeah, dystocia. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Shoulder Shoulder dystocia. Dystocia. But I'm translating yeah. it from yeah. Arabic yeah. and yeah. Persian. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Tony, yeah, get her to off her, yeah, get no, her no. off her back, get her yeah, off okay, her yeah. back, and do hands and knees. Hands and knees, ladies. This then then this can pop up, and it gets and you deliver the posterior shoulder it works every time. Most, yeah. most, of, most of the time, the shoulder dystocia comes because trying to speed up the delivery. Yeah. For yes. The, for yes. The, the posture, yeah. yeah. For, for the position the, the, the lady has, uh, Gail has, has said, I mean, uh, if she is on, on, his, on her back, it is more uh, probably that she, she could have a shoulder, uh, I mean, the baby could, uh, could have a shoulder dystocia. Uh, then it is uh, to allow the, the woman to have delivery in the position she wants. Usually the, the best position are, uh, sorry, uh, standing or, uh, I mean, the vertical position. But every woman has to feel how, how is the, the best way for, for, for delivery. But speed, speeding it up and uh, putting the, the woman in, in her back, I think, are the main, uh, the main causes of, of shoulder dystocia. Can I ask I the agree. other question? Yes, please. I want to say something about, okay, first of all, my question is, how can we prevent shoulder dystocia? And so I agree absolutely with uh, Gail and Antonio, because... Uh, positioning of the, the woman is one thing, but the second thing is, okay, say in case you have in a hospital scenario, for whatever reason, a woman that has uh, an epidural maybe, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. is maybe not so mobile, and you're suddenly facing the fact that you have a shoulder dystocia, because maybe you had been speeding up your oxytocin or syntocinosin yeah. drip. I mean, that's a reality, yeah. face it, yeah? 
And when we are amongst professionals, you have to think what next. And so I believe if you are a hospital team, you should train then how to help the woman go on all fours. Maybe the uh, Ina Gaskin's maneuver is a good thing to learn. And you know, you can't be wrong. But one thing is for sure, when you're facing a situation like this, you have to know what you have to do. And one thing is for sure, get the woman in a different position and help her out. The solution is not cutting an episiotomy. I can tell you no. that. No, no, I mean, the episiotomy mm. makes nothing. No, 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 I know. no because the no, shoulders no, no, no. are stuck. But I know in some countries, this is still taught. Cut yeah, an episiotomy makes space, but when the shoulders yeah. are stuck behind the pubic bone, you can make as much space as you want. When the key <laughs> is stuck, you know, it won't help to make it bigger. You need you to move Make the, the space key. in the bones, exactly. Move the exactly. woman, exactly. Yes. That's very, so that very could good. be part of our training as well, too. But my idea is prevent it and know what to do when it's happening. Absolutely. Exactly. I was going to say that most of us uh, who have, uh, in the places that we work, they tend to uh, train the midwives every frequent time, every six months, every year to uh, practice in emergency situations. What are we going to do? Who is getting what? Who is leading? Who is writing? And, and of course, this is also uh, a very good uh, part of the, the training that, that we're offering. Very, very good. Can I ask a next question, please? Yes. Yeah, um, our uh, attendees, they're asking which kind of non-pharmacological pain relief each of you from your place and your profession advice. We want to hear the new and your traditional pain relief that you are applying for your clients in your region. Thank you. Water. Water. I love it. Water bird. Water bird. Aquaponate, but everything in water. <laughs> there, there are some studies that compare pain relief of water immersion with epidural and one-to-one uh, -one care. <laughs> Even uh, in home cares, in home births, we give sometimes two-to-one care or three-to-one care. It depends which are the needs of that woman of contact and presence. Some woman just need to be like with her husband. But as much, especially nowadays in coronavirus times, <laughs> there are some colleagues of me Colleagues who uh, are afraid of And I'm oh, sorry, something someone's talking. And uh, some colleagues, some of my colleagues, they are afraid of touching because cor because Corona, and this is horrible. <laughs> mm. uh, because this is part of our uh, care. So just uh, contact and uh, press uh, care one to one or whatever. Water immersion, hot. Sometimes uh, some women really love hot uh, tissues on her back, back massage. And we also work with, uh, my team, we also work with back flowers and acupuncture. Thank you so much. Any other recommendation, please? Well, well I, I... You, can, you can teach hypnobirthing. Uh, you can teach self-visualization. And the best thing is acknowledging it. Say, yes, I know it hurts. Yes, let's change position. This can help. Let me rub your back. Let me rub your feet. Um, acknowledge it and tell them that it, the contraction goes away. You're very soon going to have your baby. Everything positive, empowering is what will help with pain. Yeah. Very good. Fear is very, it's what really works against pain. In, in our lives. Just this imagine. Is the hormones again. Yes. Just imagine if we were told since we are little, uh, the first time you have sex is horrible. It hurts so much. It's just the worst experience ever. But <laughs> that's what we what we hear about birth. So we don't if we don't have the information, if it's everything that we hear from outside, we are coming to birth scared, afraid, and obviously against that tightness in your muscles and against that fear, 
it's going to be very, very difficult to do something in that moment, which we can, of course, as we were saying, with water, with massage, with uh, acupuncture, acupressure. Yes, but I think information is key. It's those uh, midwives teaching those women how their body works, what they can do to uh, have a healthy pregnancy, to develop, to, to remove all that fear, to make that oxytocin going up and to not be fearful of, of birth. And to yeah. be with women, to be with women, sincerely to be with that woman, to really give her all your love and all your confidence. I've had so many births at home where women were so full of fear and I took their hand and said, we're going together through the salvaje de parto, through, the, through the, the absolute savage aspects of birth. We are together and I will be with you. Eye to eye contact, absolute confidence and love. This transforms with women, women with women carrying themselves through birth. It transforms the birth experience from fear and pain into that real kind of aesthetic and aesthetic experience of, of, of loving and powerful birth. Yep. Another thing I wanted to, to point out is uh, uh, the movement. I mean, to be uh, lying down or be uh, uh, without moving increases the pain too. I mean, I, 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 I am just adding what you have said. I mean, completely uh, agree with uh, all you have said, but I, did, I think this is very important too, to allow, to allow, what is the word, but to allow uh, <laughs> to move. Right to move when they are uh, having the contraction, it is important too, okay? Uh, and on the other hand, they, I think they specifically ask for pharmacological one. I mean, I think uh, uh, in our hospital for those cases where it is needed, we are using uh, something that is very common in the, in the UK, but it's not very common in other countries. For example, in Spain, it's, uh, very few hospitals have the, uh, the gas and air. Okay, they call it, it uh, uh, in the UK, the gas and air is uh, nitrous oxide. I think this is... Uh, in, in nitrous English. oxide. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Laughing gas. Yeah, yeah. laughing yeah. gas. Uh, what, uh, well, uh, yeah, before you do the epidural, I think uh, it will work. But I think if with all, everything we have, we have said about uh, education, about uh, uh, light off, water on, it is very important to movement, uh, intimacy is very important to the, the, the intimacy and to know and to know that it could be uh, they are actually they are real the orgasmic delivery the orgasmic yes. childbirth I have seen uh, several of them and, uh, yeah and me too <laughs> to know, uh, it is important important for them to know that it could happen when I talk to uh, about this with a woman they say oh but that that is uh, just in movies that is not true I say no no it is true I mean it happens if you are in a good environment, if you are allowed to uh, to move, you 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 are taken care of. You have intimacy. You have uh, no no light or very very uh, um, uh, <laughs> and that. I mean, I think every everything is important about that. Yes. Also, uh, making women see or telling them that uterus is a muscle, it's a big muscle, and I talk of, uh, of labor as a marathon, it's a marathon. Uh, would you stop a runner of marathon and tell him, stop, you have to take an epidural, you're suffering. It's a, a muscle work. So if you breathe and you go with it, and you say one step more, one step more, you can go through that marathon. Hmm. Uh, let me just say, because I'm, I'm getting many questions on, on writing, and there is one of them that just keeps uh, appearing, and is, uh, what do you think, my uh, dear colleagues? Uh, they're asking us if we could develop a course in uh, vaginal birth after cesarean section. Cool. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. 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 Fantastic. Be back here. Yes. Be back here. Yes. Yes. Because yeah. you know so, the, the new guidelines in Germany have been out, and we in Germany, okay, in, in hospitals, it has been very common to be able to give birth after cesarean section. And we also have to understand with the rising rate of C-sections, 30 to 80 percent globally, yeah, needless to say that, of course, uh, every study has shown that women are so much put on risk uh, after they had a cesarean section. Of course, we love it when it's really needed. 
but you know that should be 10 to 15 percent according to WHO. And there's many tips and tricks to allow or not allow to make it possible for a woman to have a good birth after a, a C-section. Absolutely. But that is something where you really have to take into a course because there's a few things you need to consider. What type of, um, what's the scar like? How long has it been? Yeah, is it less than one year between pregnancies? There's a number of things where you have to be precautious because of course it was still a C-section. But if you understand some of the rules and things to look for, absolutely no induction and things like this. And then you need ways how to get the woman easily into labor, take the fear out of her experience. Yeah, it's wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah. Possible. I really and make horse um, even for obstetrician because in other countries, obstetrician yes. should oh. be develop their skills in VBAC. They have any fear. And Dr. Antonio oh. is our team. You'll help them. <laughs> that was gonna that was gonna be my question. My question is who's the course for? We need the course for the doctors. Yes. That's very true. And the thing was, I think, because uh, these questions were, were coming mainly from, from India, it's because uh, the high amount of cesarean sections that then uh, they tell women that once you have a section, you're going to have a section afterwards. And we know because we have work in, and we work in other places where there is a lot of research, there's a lot of evidence that one section doesn't mean another section, but that's very true. We can train people, we can train with uh, midwives, we can train doctors to look after a woman who has had a previous cesarean section during childbirth in a safety in a safety safe way. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I mean that, that is an important issue. Uh, I don't know in other countries here in in Spain it is very rare the section the up down sections you know the vertical sections that that ones yes if you have one one of two sections uh, you, you have to have it. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. If but you have the, a, this one, thing, yes. Yeah. The normal thing is to have the horizontal section in the in the low set low segment. Do sections uh, you you can have a. You, you can have a, have a vaginal delivery after section without any problem. After one section, after two sections, even after three sections. Yeah. Can I say something, Antonio? The only time I've seen a, a long cut, sort of, was with a woman who had a, a, a life-threatening eclampsia at uh, 21 weeks. And yeah. so she had a C-section and that woman was in eye care about five years ago. So she's the only one I've seen in the past 38 years that had, you know, uh, incision yeah. like that. That is yeah. was old style. Yeah. Nowadays, I think that is the the only the only situation where the, it is indicated. I mean, when it is a very exactly. um, premature, yes, a very premature baby, when it is below 27, 26, 27 weeks, and you have to do a section, you need to do it uh, the corporate one, the the vertical one. Because if not, it's very difficult to get the baby out. Then, uh, but after after 26, 27 weeks, you can do the the, the normal the normal now section, and it is not needed. But I don't See? know how it is how it is in India. It's why I I, I did that. Uh, I raised that question because I don't know how it is uh, in India or other countries if they do that kind of section or the other. I I I, I don't know about that. Unfortunately, yeah. in Uganda, the majority of women who um, are sectioned, especially in the villages, have classical uh, scars. Perhaps I, I don't know why. It's vertical why or horizontal? It vertical. Uh, ver vertical, yeah. yeah. Well, probably most, of, most of them in the villages. But okay. the uterus also, uh, because I've seen vertical scars in the skin, but then the uterus has been cut um, horizontally. Mm, mm. Yeah, it is, it is very Unfortunately, we don't see notes, so we don't know. But what I know, what I know in Iran, this is horizontally. But if it be in the very emergency cases, they do vertical. Even in UAE, we are working our cesarean section according UK protocol. Is most of them is, uh, is not vertical. Vertical is only for emergency. In India as well, I saw is the same. This is the same. I haven't seen that much vertical uh, if unnecessary in, in un emergency cesarean. I have to say, I have to say that it is a, a myth too. I mean, when it is an emergency, you can do the, the section horizontal too. I mean, yeah. it, 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 you, you, you can take the baby out as yeah. far, as fast or even faster 
doing a horizontal one than doing a vertical one. The only uh, situation where I see it is important to do a vertical one is when the baby is too small, because the because the the uterus is not still big enough to do a, a, an horizontal one, and the and then the the opening you do is not enough for taking the baby out uh, safely. But uh, I have I have made uh, sections with, with uh, pro, for example with Basa uh, Previa. And uh, and the baby very badly. I mean, less than five minutes, the, the baby's out with a horizontal one. I mean, it, it is not necessary in, in emergency, but it depends in every country. And I, I would say too that uh, sometimes we do in the skin uh, vertical and then in the uterus of horizontal, but it is just when the lady got a scar, a previous scar, a vertical scar because of the operation, because she had a, a, whatever, in the bowels operation or whatever, and she, she, she's got in the, her abdomen a, a, a vertical scar, then we go through that to avoid, to avoid another, another scar. But when we reach to the uterus, to the womb, we do a, a horizontal one. Yes. I don't know if I am explaining myself. Exactly, yeah. yes. It's yes. very important to, 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 to have the records of the Previous section. That is very this is important. the problem. This is the problem, doctor. Most of countries they don't have report of internal surgery because some of them they are in um, it is horizontal. But the doctor says we don't have the report of previous surgery. We are not sure what's happened inside of the sutures. And they said it's become very thin and will be ruptured. It is the fear most of gynecologists in Iran, India, UAE. They are facing with that because they don't have previous history of surgery from the patient. That could be a problem, of course, because you don't know how, how they did that. I know, for example, in Spain, I, I am I'm quite confident that unless it was a premature baby, uh, the section uh, was, was made uh, horizontal because it's the way we do. I mean, it's very, very rare to have a, a vertical one. Uh, but if we have in the Canary Islands, I don't know if you know, but we are actually not in Europe, but in Africa. We are very close to Africa. And here is coming a lot of people from Africa. And sometimes when the lady had a, a previous section, it is very difficult to know which kind of section uh, she had because mm -hmm. it hasn't got any records or anything. Then uh, sometimes it, it is, could be tricky. All right. So let me just one quick uh, question, uh, Tony. Uh, isn't it easier to heal and to cut horizontally? I mean, the uterus, not the, the belly, but because for me, the only person I've seen who had an horizontal, uh, a vertical uh, suture in her belly that actually it was cut, what I know that the lowest segment of the uterus is the easiest one to cut and to heal. So yeah. what I mean is, would the majority of doctors n know that? In, in Spain, in the UK, they, they are the countries I know about that. Uh, they do. I mean, doctors know that the best way to do it is uh, the low segment, the horizontal uh, uh, cutting, you know, but uh, and I think in in Spain it is it is up, uh, almost totally abandoned the the vertical one, but that, except except in very uh, premature babies. I understood that. So what I mean, if it was abandoned to do it vertically, what what was the medical reason for it? Like they discovered that the other one was much better. Because it um, it uh, it bleeds less. I mean, when it is a, a, a horizontal one in the low in the lower segment, uh, it, the, the bleeding is is uh, <laughs> little. I mean, it's, it's not very much. The, the the you just may contract after you you cut and you uh, after the suturing the uterus can contract much better when it is uh, in the lower segment horizontally. Then it is uh, less bleeding, and it heals faster. And if uh, it is, uh, if, she, if she has another pregnancy, she can have a vaginal delivery, and it is very important. Okay, thank you, thank you so yeah. much. So... Yeah, there is other section, but I don't, I don't, see, I don't know, I don't think it is a mom probably now. But uh, it is very important too. Uh, I think to 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 suture it in just one um, 
one layer, not in two layers. The other thing, the technical things that we could yes. talk about that, but it, it, it will be probably in a course where we can talk about that more profusely. Very good. So uh, I don't know if there are any more, more questions. Yeah, there is question, we, but I don't know if we have time because they're asking about management of preeclampsia, but I don't know if uh, we are uh, going we, to finish let, this session. Let's say we are developing an online midterm course for all health professionals, and we will be uh, sharing the uh, curriculum and the dates very soon with you. Of course, we would love to answer every single question, but we, we, we cannot do that now because it's been quite a while here. I'm sure that if we carried on talking, some of us will stay here for five hours, uh, but it's not fair on our <laughs> panelists and on everyone who is there trying to find out how to contact us, what to do. So I'm passing back to you, Leila, to let them know if they uh, want to contact us, how, how, what's the best way of doing it. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you everybody to attending our program. We are sending you your certificate through email according to what you registered your name and we will be in contact with you. We have coming session uh, every month, the same program we are going to uh, arrange for all of you. Plus we will have uh, one small course about treatment, new in treatment of cervicitis and vaginitis with Dr. Antonio for next two weeks in Friday. We will announce all of our co uh, training course. Plus we have online courses with this um, lovely, brilliant uh, team. And we will have hands off course and practical training in Georgia and India for all of you. So just you come to us, write your suggestion and question. Lily Mom is with you. We are here in India and we will cover all of the world with this fantastic thing. Thank you for all of your attendance and your being patient with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leila. Namaste. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Is everything written on the chat? So just put your WhatsApps, your email there. It's just coming there. So you have all the, all the information. I just want to say thank you to each one of the panelists who have been here today. I want to say thank you to each person who's been listening to us and asking questions and, and making us have such a great time. I'm going to switch off now and I hope that this oxytocin that we've shared <laughs> together today is uh, at a high level as we have uh, all shared this uh, expertise and this uh, beautiful time. Thank you very much, take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank Thank you. Thank you.